Ukraine, Gaza, Sudan. These are just some of the places where armed conflicts are raging. At a time of growing instability, countries around the world are preparing for war. So who's ready and who's lagging behind? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, when the Cold War ended, Western countries started redirecting military spending into other areas like education and social services. But now, with real and potential threats growing, defence budgets are on the rise. Just how dangerous is this latest global arms race? 75 years ago, leaders from North America and Europe signed the NATO Treaty in the hopes the alliance would deter future attacks. If there is anything certain today, if there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. Three quarters of a century later, there is war on European soil, though not with a NATO member. Nevertheless, many nearby countries feel under threat. If we want peace and we want peace, if we want security and stability, it's extremely uh, important to improve our defence capacities, our defence capabilities and to build uh, a European, a true European Union in defence. After decades of steady decline, military spending by EU nations is picking up. And when it comes to who's benefiting from that uptick, France has become the second largest arms exporter after the United States, with Russia falling to third spot. Given the war in Ukraine, it's not surprising that Russia is exporting less and also finding fewer buyers. The global arms trade was estimated to be worth around $127 billion in 2021, which is more than the GDP of Ecuador. And with wars raging in many parts of the world and showing few signs of slowing, that number is likely to increase. But what's clear from the current fighting, preparing for war is less costly than being part of one. Well, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is David DeRoche. He's a former official at the U.S. Department of Defense. Michael Peck is a defense journalist and a columnist at the Center for European Policy Analysis. He joins us from Oregon in the U.S. Here with me in the studio, I'm delighted to say, is Paul Ingram, academic program manager at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge and David Stupples. He's Professor of Electronic and Radio Engineering at City University of London. A warm welcome to Roundtable to all of you, gents. Uh, I'll come to you first, David. All of this spending on defence, this this race to arm and and get more and more armaments, is it really needed? Uh, That's a good question. Um, It's it's not needed uh, unless you don't have a war. So uh, the theory behind at least Western defense spending is deterrence. And the paradox is you need a lot of stuff to deter, but then you never use a lot of stuff. So um, it's, it's more of a philosophical argument than a budget argument, I'm afraid. And Michael, what's your take on whether or not this colossal outlay on arms at the moment is needed? Like, I mean, where does this race end? Well, I think we're seeing a lot of... Con- um, a lot of issues in the world that maybe were glossed over during the Cold War that are that are being hashed out in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, in Asia. Um, I think we tend to look at stuff in terms of still in terms of uh, this, uh, the U.S., Russia, China, but there's a lot of regional conflicts outstanding that I, I think are driving this. So. Until those conflicts are resolved uh, one way or another, I I think we're going to see this for a while. Paul, the United Kingdom, I've seen so many defence leaders in recent weeks and months say that, you know, warnings to government, we need to be doing more, we need to be spending more, we simply don't have enough bullets if there were to be a conflict. Is that where the UK is at at the moment? Gosh, I could speak on this for half an hour, but I'll be as brief as I can. Please. The problem is, is that, is that there are many interests involved here, domestically, uh, internally, as well as globally. So uh, when there is a defence minister or there's a defence industry representative and there's lots of lobbying that goes on, there is 
an interest in saying exactly that. It depends on your objective. If your objective is to stay very close to the United States and the two of us with, al with allies pursue an objective of strategic dominance, then of course you need as much as you can get hold of. But the trouble is, is that anybody that disagrees with that is then into an arms race with you and it just spirals out of control. Spiraling out of control is bad for money, it's also bad for stability. David, would you say that the UK has fallen behind in terms of defence expenditure? Uh, it has marginally, but what it's actually done is spent on a lot of money on very, very high tech. And so what's happened is the, the people that do the, the work, the, the boots on the ground, are suffering. And if you look around the conflicts that could be occurring over the next few years, uh, then we'll certainly need boots on the ground. So uh, we'd have to increase our um, spend it, expenditure to get more troops. That's you mentioned high tech. I saw a story the other day that the UK has spent millions on drones that have been modified so many times that they're not fit for purpose. I don't, it, I don't think that's true. Yes, they've been modified, but they have to be modified because there's a drone war going on at the moment uh, and we can see exactly what's happening in that. So what we're trying to do is make certain that we're uh, on a par with all the drones being used in the world. So I think that's the more likely the reason. The, the other thing I would say is that the proportion of the defence spending being spent on nuclear weapons, and particularly on the yeah. Trident replacement, has more than doubled. Yeah. And, and that's because costs are spiralling and there's no way of controlling. And that, that, that's quite serious yeah. for the rest of the defence budget. David, you're in the United States. You've got a huge, huge day coming in November. Your presidential elections coming up. If Donald J. Trump wins, what impact do you think that will have on defense spending for the United States for the next few years? Surprisingly little, actually. Um, you know, Trump is... The, the best thing I've heard about Trump is that uh, his, his supporters take him seriously, but not literally, and his detractors take him literally and not seriously. So some of his remarks about our partners who have underspent, um, you know, about, you know, leaving NATO and all that, I view that as uh, business language, not diplomatic language. And if you actually look at the actions in office, you know, Trump was persuaded by the bureaucracy to stay in Afghanistan. Um, you know, people predicted exactly what happened. Biden, on the other hand, was more Trump-like than Trump. Uh, and, and managed to do what Trump wanted to do. So I, th I think what we'll see is some changes along the margins, but there actually is agreement uh, on the general thrust of U.S. defense policy and on the general uh, emerging threat. And there is a, a, almost unanimity, at least in think tank world, about uh, the neglected threat of China and the changed uh, uh, way that uh, Russia uh, is approaching the world and the nature of warfare in Russia. And that's, that's not really a partisan issue. Michael, would you go along with that? Do you think very little will change if Trump replaces Biden? I think U.S. security policy on the whole since World War II has been, has been pretty consistent. You don't tend to find huge amounts of variation. That being said, there is that significant isolationist trend uh, among the not even the far right of the Republican Party anymore, the Republican Party in general. And that that is, um, I, I'm not sure anymore. I, 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 it's hard to believe America would leave NATO or uh, renege on other commitments, but I, I wouldn't say it's impossible anymore. Or at least the decision-making process um, could become so paralyzed by partisan issues that effectively America is almost neutralized as a world player. Well, Margrethe Vestager is the executive vice president of the European Commission, and she recently said that Europe needs to be less reliant on the United States. Let's just have a listen to what she said. We need to get the transatlantic balance right. Irrespective of election, electoral dynamics in the US, we must take more responsibility for our own security. While, of course, remaining fully committed to our NATO uh, uh, alliance. An improved in ability to act will make us a stronger ally. Paul, she's got a point, hasn't she, that Europe needs to kind of look after itself more and rely less on the United States? I think that's absolutely true. I think Europe does need to uh, stand on its own two feet. That doesn't necessarily mean spending more on defence. It means spending more cleverly. 
uh, Europe already, the European NATO states already spend four times as much as Russia on defence. Uh, and that needs to be spent in ways that, that are effective and where Europe is interoperable if one is interested in military capability. One also has to have Europe Europe spending significant money on diplomacy around the world so that so that Europe is actually um, speaking as well as 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 well as having the capability to uh, to influence uh, outcomes. David, do you think a lot of <coughs> European capitals will be looking at what's going on in the States, Trump coming in and they'll be thinking, you know, we need to start looking after ourselves here? Well, I disagree a little bit about that. Is it because our defence systems are uh, totally integrated with those of the United States, uh, our intelligence systems, our strategic systems, etc. So, uh, and that also uh, is the same for Germany and France, but more so with the UK. But so, um, yeah, I think America will be saying to us, you've got to take on more of the uh, responsibility of looking after Europe. Uh, and I think that's a very fair point. But uh, I don't think that we could... Um, genuinely move away from the America because of the integration. That's my, my take on that. Well, let's take a look at the countries that spend the most on defence compared to the size of their economy. So according to this analysis by Bloomberg Economics, Russia topped the list at 4.4% of GDP last year. The US was next, spending 3.3%. South Korea, the UK and Iran round off the top five. China sits in 11th place but is likely to move up the list as it ramps up its military spending. Um, David, I'll come to you. What's the feeling in the States? You know, when you speak to your average American, they're worried about mortgage prices, interest rates, gas prices. Does defense spending come up as a topic when you're talking to your friends? It does, but I live in Washington, and, and uh, I'm kind of a weirdo, and my friends are kind of weirdos. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you look just at dollars, it gets a little, uh, it's a little misleading. So, for example, we don't have a national health system in the United States. Uh, one of the, Donald Rumsfeld famously said the Department of Defense healthcare spending is increasing at such a rate that in 20 years, we're going to be a health plan that flies a few airplanes. Um, so, and, and, you know, the fact that we have volunteer militaries, say in the United States, where we have to pay to recruit, whereas some other countries, you know, just, um, put people into the armed forces without them having much of a say, uh, also increases our, our expenditure. So it's, it's a little, um, misleading. I think that the issue is not so much about the importance of defense and defense spending. There seems to be a consensus that we have global interests and we need to have the capability to defend those global interests whether or not we actually need to at any given point is sort of the thrust of the isolationism strain in america but the question is how do we do it so it's you know do we do we perpetuate these aircraft carriers which is just a linear progression from world war ii or do we actually say hmm ship you know advanced missiles pose a threat we need smaller ships mm -hmm. do we really need the joint strike fighter or perhaps unmanned uh, fighter aircraft unmanned bomber aircraft things like that it's more about how we spend the money not do we need to spend it mm. michael wouldn't the average american rather have accessible health care over a very flashy expensive defense budget i think on the whole, yes, I think we're very much the American public is, is tending to be more inwardly focused now. And I don't think I, I don't think China is, is quite on everybody's mind. I think as much as economic competition as anything, would Americans favor greater defense spending? In the face of in the face of a, of a clear threat, perhaps, but I don't know that. Ukraine is considered that threat. I don't know that Taiwan is considered that threat. They're they're distant and abstract enough that I I, I wouldn't say there was this over, over, uh, overwhelming support for 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 uh, for military invention, intervention in those conflicts. Paul, let's talk about nuclear risk. I mean, are we getting to the stage now where there's so much money being spent and so much? cash being invested in these programs that at some stage someone will use a nuclear weapon? I don't think it's that closely related. I mean, we did get through the Cold War where the amount of money and the numbers of warheads was 
dramatically higher than, than they are now and probably ever will be, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, but it's more in terms of the attitudes of the leaderships. So we had an American general this week say uh, we need to go back to Cold War practices, uh, which were, in hindsight, quite sensible, including arms control, uh, um, uh, direct forms of communication, uh, and a shared understanding, even if the ideologies were so very different. I'm not clear that we need to be going back to the Cold War, but we certainly need to be doing those things. Uh, and and I th I'm worried by the emphasis on nuclear arms. We need to be moving towards more uh, uh, smart and uh, actually usable uh, weapon systems rather than these weapon systems that rely upon reputation rather than use, uh, which I think is, is, is profoundly dangerous uh, in, in, because ultimately strategic deterrence is, uh, is unstable if it is seen as incredible and non-credible. And I think, I fear that nuclear weapons and the use of nuclear weapons is not always seen as credible as we would like to think. What's your take on the whole nuclear situation, David? Um, I, I couldn't disagree with that. I mean, that, that, that's a very good analysis. Um, but I think that one of the things that we should be looking at is that uh, a lot of warfare focus is on kinetic warfare, where we're actually going to use arms, etc. Uh, the start of any warfare in the future is going to be non-kinetic, and it's going to be probably electronic warfare of some description. Uh, and I know we're going to get onto that later. But the, um, there, I think, is, is an imbalance between the, the two. We're probably spending too much on uh, kinetic stuff, uh, and we're not focusing enough on the non-kinetic. And I think there lies a real problem. And it's not only us, it's the states as well. Just in, in your expertise, how many countries are now putting money into electronic warfare, jamming signals, you know, maybe even taking out payment systems? We've seen a lot of this kind of hacking happen lately. Well, uh, Russia have, have been... Uh, uh, certainly have overtaken in, in the last few years in electronic warfare. Uh, North Korea are, are reasonably good at it. China are investing huge amounts of money in electronic warfare. And then if you look at Iran, they're doing the same, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so therefore, people are focusing on it. But Europe tends to be not focusing on it. And there's, a, there's something I'd like to add to that, which is that ultimately, a leadership, a regime is most vulnerable to, uh, to these kind of shifts. When, when, when another country attacks or threatens to attack, it tends to unite a country behind the leadership. When, that, when, when there is all sorts of disinformation and, and, and values questioning and all the rest of it, as we are seeing in the United States in the run up to the, uh, to the election, and almost certainly uh, foreign interference in that election, it, it starts to wobble things. And I think, I think we have under, underestimated until now that, that, that challenge to, to uh, countries. David, let's talk yes, about I... China and Russia. In the last two years mm -hmm. since Russia's war against Ukraine began, those two countries <clears throat> are getting ever closer. Is that something that people in the West are very concerned about? Somewhat, but uh, this idea that there'll be a Chinese-Russian alliance, I think it's viewed more as a a marriage of convenience, uh, or, or really even just a tryst of convenience. Um, they don't really have similar interests in the same part of the world other than a dislike for the existing rules-based liberal world order. So I think they've kind of, what the way they view things is that Russia uh, wants to have a sphere of influence in the former Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact. China wants to have a sphere of influence in uh, East Asia. I suppose we could call it the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Uh, and they want the United States and other countries out of those spheres of influence. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else is, is just sort of a commercial barter arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, what does concern the United States about China are two things. First, the possibility that they could destabilize the economies of East Asia, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, uh, as well as the emerging economies in Vietnam, Malaysia, places like that, Indonesia. The second concern is that our nuclear architecture is based on a United States-Soviet Union-Russia framework of laws, and China has suddenly emerged 
as uh, potentially a near peer nuclear power. And there's not the, the uh, framework of treaties and agreements to deal with that. And it basically upsets the assumptions that underline the American uh, treaties with the Soviet Union and with Russia. So those are kind of the issues. Michael, what do you think will happen if Trump becomes president? The whole dynamic with China and Russia, do you think they would welcome a Trump presidency over <clears throat> another five years of Biden? I think they would welcome chaos and paralysis in the, in, in, in the United States. Yeah. I don't know that and Trump is pretty good at providing that. I don't know that they favor Trump per se as, as being pro-Russian or pro-Chinese, certainly not pro-Chinese. I think they would, they, would, they, would, they would be dealing with an, an erratic actor. So at a certain level, I, I don't know that they favor Trump, but they do like the, the effects that Trump is having on the American political system and its uh, national security decision-making. Paul, just talk to me about space. Uh, there seems to be an added emphasis on the space race for armaments as well. I mean, why are countries getting interested in putting weapons in space? Well, so space, first and foremost, is mostly about communications, intelligence, about, um, about surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't weapons in space at the moment. There's no prospect in the very immediate term of weapons in space, but there is some exploration. So two months ago, we did have this, this uh, intelligence leak in the US or, or uh, uh, expose. Uh, which suggested that the Russians were exploring the possibility of putting weapons in space. Uh, there are a variety of reasons we could get into them, why there's some doubt as to whether the, the Russians would contemplate putting a nuclear weapon in space, but certainly there is exploration by all countries in the space race to think about how they can take out satellites uh, from the ground. Uh, and, and of course, we also had President Reagan uh, some decades ago talking about Star Wars, which would be actually easier to take out satellites than it would have been to take out um, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles in mid-course. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of work, there's a lot of research, but I don't think we're on the cusp of a weapons in space arms race quite yet. Um, but we, but you know, never say never and actually I think we are going in that direction. David, let's just take a look at some of the numbers for space. So space rapidly becoming the next frontier in warfare. Many countries developing systems that can take out their rival satellites, as Paul said. The US has by far the largest number of satellites in orbit, numbering more than 3,400. China and the UK are a distant second and third with around 500 apiece. Russia has 170 satellites in space. Most satellites are used for commercial purposes. Governments, militaries, and civilian organizations operate most of the rest. My question to you is, you know, if someone does take out someone else's satellite, um, if there's an explosion, debris in space, what happens? Does that stuff just go around in eternity? Yes, is the answer to that. At incredible speed, about 7.6 kilometers a second. Well, wow. and uh, the risk then of this debris then knocking into other satellites is, is very huge. high. Yeah, um, and uh, although it's above the space station, most of this this uh, debris or most debris would be, but it would just knock out other people's satellites. So therefore, fracticide is is going to be uh, key here. So you would try to not, if you're going to take out a satellite, you would try not to create uh, a huge amount of debris. That's 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 the bottom line there. Well. David, your country is winning the space race. I mean, is America, you're, you're, not, you're not convinced? Well, we, we, we put up more satellites in there and we've developed a greater dependency on satellites uh, doing it. But uh, we haven't really tested an offensive weapon. I mean, it's, it's important to note when we talk about weapons in space, uh, they're confined to that domain. There's not a space-based weapon that can attack Earth. It's it's uh, weapons in space taking out satellites. But as we develop this capability for communications and navigation from space, we create a vulnerability and a dependency. And, the, you know, the Chinese and the Russians have both 
tested anti-satellite weapons and a significant amount of the space junk that David spoke of is from those two tests. Um, but you know, the Russian uh, possibility of using a nuclear weapon basically shows that they said, look, we don't have as many stakes uh, in space. And so we will use something that can destroy almost everything. And uh, that will affect you. That will hurt you more than it will us. So I'm not sure if you can speak of winning the space race so much as uh, we more effectively uh, operate in space. But that creates vulnerabilities in its own right. Paul, Michael, and both Davids, thank you all so much for your insight on this roundtable. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see, please do hit the subscribe button. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.